subject and my questions, the question that I am interested in. And let me first start with some introduction about what I mean by spectral geometry. So the standard picture is when we're looking at, on a compact Riemannian manifold, we have the Laplace Beltrami operator. It is a self-adjoint with a complete set of eigenfunctions with three non-negative eigenvalues that are ordered increasingly. The first one, by the way, is always zero with the constant eigenfunction. And the standard questions that we ask are the relation of these functions and eigenvalues to uh, the object, the manifold, which is the topology and the metric, and whether we can compute the spectrum, and if so, if, can we do it explicitly or implicitly? Uh, can we describe the dependence of the spectrum in the metric and in the topology? And any other properties that we can talk about, uh, properties of the eigenfunctions? There's a famous uh, 66 question by Mario Katz, can one hear the shape of a drum? Which is an inverse problem. Can we deduce the, the object that we're looking at using the spectrum and maybe using properties of eigenfunctions? So that's spectral geometry on, in a nutshell. And the object that I'm interested in, uh, the objects are metal graphs. So uh, instead of having a manifold M and a metric G, we're going to have a graph, gamma, and the set of edge lengths, L, which will be the metric. Uh, the graph will have edges and vertices, and we have an uh, edge length such that every edge E will have the length LE. We denote it like that. Now, the, the standard question at this point would be, what's the difference between a metric graph and a weighted discrete graph? So I'm sorry for those that can't see what I draw here on the board, but when a discrete graph, the function gets the value, whether it's weighted or not, the function gets its values on the vertices. So eventually, the spectrum is going to be finite, no matter how we're looking at it. While we're talking about a metric graph, so a function gets its values. Okay, so back to where we are. So I explained what's the difference between a metric graph and a weighted discrete graph. So for metric graph, the Laplacian is not the sum matrix, but it's actually the, we can speak about the differential uh, operator defined edgewise on each edge is just minus the second derivative. And in order for that to be a self-adjoint operator, we need some kind of vertex conditions. We refine ourselves to a smaller set of functions, uh, space of functions. We are looking at functions which are continuous at every vertex and whose incoming derivatives uh, sums up to zero. Can you okay. Yeah. Um, can you get me? See me? Okay. So under this setting, uh, when we have such a graph, a metric graph with Laplace and Neumann vertex conditions, we get a complete family of eigenfunctions and we get a set of eigenvalues. Uh, again, the eigenvalues are arranged increasingly, goes from zero for the constant function, goes up to infinity. It is standard to use the square roots of the eigenfunctions. And now we can talk about their dependence in the object. And now the object is much more easy to deal with because we can talk about the topology coming from the discrete graph and we can talk about the metric, which is just the set of the edge lengths that we're talking about. And this is what we refer to as the spectrum and eigenfunctions of the metric graph. And so that's spectral geometry on metric graphs. Now let me talk about a bit about results in the field. So. Let me first start with examples for spectral results. So we can implicitly calculate the, the spectrum. So von Bello showed in 85 that we have, we can build a secular function, so-called. That's, that's a function of k for which its zeros are going to be the spectrum of uh, the graph. So that's one way of calculating it. Now, if you want to do something more fancy, if you want some kind of spectral averages, more data, that it's more convenient to use the spectral density for which we have an exact trace formula from 97 by Kotos and Smilansky. And 
This is the exact trace formula. Uh, the thing that I want to, to explain here is that we're summing over the space periodic orbits. This is where the geometry of the graph kicks in. And the main issue here is that it's exact, unlike the case for, uh, for compact manifolds where we have a trace formula, but it's not exact. It's, it has some kind of an error, which goes to zero when k goes to infinity. So here it's an advantage that it is exact. Some state-of-the-art result, and I'm going to do some name blocking here, but uh, Kurosov and Sarnak recently showed that for metric graphs with incommensurate edge lengths, this means that the edge lengths are uh, independent over the rationals, the, the spectral density is going to have exotic properties it is always a positive crystalline measure, but it's going to have exotic properties of such a measure. It is a Fourier quasi-crystal, and it does not contain any Dirac comb, meaning that uh, there are no arithmetic progressions in, inside the, the spectrum. This is if I assume that the graph is simple, otherwise there are, but I'm not going to discuss it. This answered several, uh, several open questions in the field. What is an exotic process? Yeah, so is exotic mean? Exotic mean that it has, uh, it, it has properties that you wouldn't expect from a standard crystalline measure. I don't want to get into this. Okay. Um, okay, so the next thing we can talk about the results regarding eigenfunctions. So here there's a nice plot demonstrating some kind of a universal behavior, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but if you do want to listen, then I'm giving a talk about it in the analysis seminar in October 12th. So the next thing I want to talk about is quantum chaos, the relation to, to quantum chaos. So in their 97 paper, Kotos and Smilansky named this model a quantum graph. And they argued that quantum graphs with incommensurate edge lengths exhibit exotic, uh, chaotic properties. In specific, they talked about the level spacing statistics. They said the level spacing statistics is going to be the level spacing statistics of the random matrix uh, from a GOE ensemble in the limit that the matrix go to infinity. This is what we call the wigner dyson gaudin meta distribution. Brian Despar in 2000 showed that it's not quite accurate. There is a slight deviation, but the deviation seems to, to go to zero as the graph uh, grows larger, and it's still an open conjecture ever since, which I intend to work on. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the secular manifold. So that's like the machinery behind all this. Uh, so we talk about, we've talked about the secular function, so given a discrete graph, gamma, with E edges, there is some kind of a polynomial uh, from CE to C, such that for any choice of edge length, these are the L, L1 up to LB, I, I get the following equation. K squared is an eigenvalue if the right hand side here is a function of K, the polynomial when I plot in E to the IK L1 up to E to the IK LB, again, the L's are fixed, k is what's ranging. Whenever this function of k gets a zero, here I get an eigenvalue, including multiplicity. Using this picture, I can now consider the torus, the e-dimensional torus, and I define the secular manifold to be the following zero set. So I have here a point on my torus, and instead of plotting here this, I plot here the i to e to the i kappa one up to e to the i kappa e into this polynomial. Whenever I get a zero, that's a point in my manifold. And then I consider the following linear flow, the k goes to k and mod to pi. This linear flow enables me to, to present the secular equation as follows. So now k squared is an eigenvalue whenever k is a heating time of the linear flow hitting the secular manifold. So let's look at it, uh, for example, this graph and the orange manifold here is the secular manifold. It's a three-dimensional torus, so that's the box with glued edges. So the linear flow here that you see in black gets to here and then continue to here. And we can talk about the heating points. So 
this point, this first hitting point, would be a time k1. The, the second one would be a time k2. The third one, time k3. The fourth, the time k4. So this is how we get the spectrum as the heating times. Using this picture, we can talk about dynamics or ergodicity. So the sequence, once I get the edge length, the direction of this flow to be irrational, this is the incommensurate edge length, then the sequence of heating points, this, these points, these heating points, this sequence is going to equidist be equidistributed on sigma according to some given measure, which depends on the metric. And this is the tool to replace spectral averages like level spacing statistics with integration over sigma. So now the geometry of sigma plays an important role. And the last thing I want to talk about is the geometry of sigma. So Berkulaiko and Liu in 2017, and also I contribute a bit in my PhD, uh, talked about the volume, the number, the number of connected components of the regular part of sigma. So that's not actually a manifold, it's a manifold with singularity. We can talk about its regular part, and we can count connected components. Colin de Verdier in 2015 had a conjecture regarding the irreducibility of sigma, which was recently solved by Kurasov and Sarnak in a paper yet to be published. And the open question which I intend to deal with is what happened when, what happened to sigma, what can we talk, what can we say geometrically about sigma in the limit of large graph? So that's in the limit where the dimension of this manifold and this toes go to infinity. And we, we believe that it's going to become flat, it's going to become a bunch of hyperplanes. And, and the, the question is whether it is true and whether in what rate it's going to become flat. Uh, these questions uh, may give answer from the spectral uh, side to question regarding quantum unique ergodicity and level spacing statistics. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. What do you mean by university? Uh, that, that's a great question. It's actually, it's what Colin de Verdier mean and it, it can be interpreted in several ways. The way that uh, Kurasov and Sarnak interpreted it was the irreducibility of this polynomial. Uh -huh. so, uh, but Colin de Verdier didn't wrote explicitly what do we mean by irreducibility. Uh, and that's quite related to the question of number of connected components, but not exactly. These are complementary uh, questions. Yeah. When you say limit for large graph, is it just a number of uh, vertex which should become large or density not changing too much? So, so that, that's a, another great question. So, for example, in the talk that I'm going to, uh, here in the talk that I'm going to discuss, mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to talk about one limit, which is the number, the Betty number grows to infinity. Mm -hmm. So I get more and more, the, in, in a way, the graph gets more and more complicated. Mm -hmm. But there are other situations where we believe just the number of edges uh, would go to infinity. It's going to play a role. We are not talking of only about simple graphs. So we do allow loops and multiple edges and stuff like that. So we can have edges grow to infinity with only one vertex or something like that. As far as the conjecture about GOE, uh, I assume, I mean, we've discussed this, but the people who made it, did they, the graph has to get large. Uh, I'm sure it's not true if you go through any sequence. So connected with Pierre's question, do you, do you, did, I know what you think, but do people make a specific conjecture physicist? Uh, not that I know of. The only thing that I know of is in the paper of Barangas Park, where they don't give any specific uh, detail. They do speak about a graph becoming more complicated 
but they don't say anything that you can grasp on regarding how it's, is it going to be large. Because I'm sure you can make sequences where it's false with more and more uh, where it gets large. Yeah, that's another thing I hope to get to actually show that there are sequences which are not. Currently, we don't know okay. for counter okay. examples. If I look at uh, complete graphs, is it, is it everything understood in that case? Is that a complete graph? Yeah, so first of all, what we do see here is picture for complete graph, and this is a complete graph, and the answer is no, we don't know anything. Even for a complete graph, yeah. No, we, we the, the only cases that we can say something are graphs with, that are equilateral, so that all the edge lengths are the same, and in that case, the problem can be transferred into the discrete graph problem. And then it becomes like a finite problem, just that you make it periodic. Uh, so that's kind of the trivial case, but all other cases are still open. Is there a notion of a, like a spectral counting function in, in, in this context? Yes, of course, and that's exactly how uh, the trace formula, the, the trace formula, so they actually uh, compute, they actually gave the trace formula for the spectral counting function and then they took its derivative. Oh, so the, it's, the spectral counting function plays an important role in all of the works regarding uh, quantum graphs. Thanks. Any other questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.